Nearly a century ago, an event took place that changed our sense of time, of space, of our place on the Earth. The year is 1909, not quite six years after the invention of the airplane. Louis Blériot, a French aviator, sets out to do what no one has done before, to cross from France to Britain over the English Channel, an expanse of water that had held Napoleon at bay. It's a dangerous flight. The crossing stretches the airplane's technology to its limits. This thing flies like a leaf. It's not an airplane. It's just a kind of a motorized kite. Taking a kite like that across the channel, it's just like landing on the moon. 36 minutes after takeoff, Blériot stands on Britain's shore. Even from today's vantage point, it's still one of the, the great events, one of the most significant events in the history of flight. Blériot has done more than cross the channel. He has shown the world the potential of powered flight and made Paris the capital of aviation. The flight is remembered as heroic and terribly dangerous. Nevertheless, the grandson who carries Louis Blériot's name readies an attempt to repeat his grandfather's feat in a vintage Model 11. No, 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 no. No matter the year, it's still Blériot 11. Doesn't fly better, it's not like wine, doesn't age well. And so uh, it's dangerous, it's bloody dangerous. Louis Blériot dared all and changed the course of history. But what if his grandson, as he flies off on a personal mission to recreate one of aviation's most historic flights? Corporate funding for Nova is provided by Sprint and Microsoft. Additional funding is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. Major funding for NOVA is also provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by PBS viewers like you. Thank you. Louis Blériot's home is in Brittany, about five hours due west of Paris. Here, he pursues his passion for collecting memorabilia related to his grandfather. His prized possession is an original Blériot 11 aircraft. The 11 was the culmination of years of trial and error by Louis' grandfather. It became the Model T of the aviation industry, the first airplane to be mass-produced. While many museums would welcome this Blériot into their collection, it is in this featherweight antique that Louis hopes to fly the channel. I mean, an airplane is, is made for flying, even though it's a very old airplane and a historic airplane. Was well, what I think, anyway. This won't be the first attempt to cross the channel in Louis' airplane. An attempt to reenact. In 1989, he gave a young British woman the chance. Her light weight was thought to be an advantage. The vintage monoplane was forced to ditch in the sea just two miles from home. The pilot was safe, but the airplane badly damaged. The problem was not the, the ditching, but the problem was the last of the helicopter blades overturned the barrier, and so it smashed it completely, damaged the wings. It was awful as a, a ghast. The grandson of Louis Blériot, owner of the plane, disconsolate. <laughs> It took three years to restore the Blériot 11. Now Louis trains to fly the airplane himself. He is as determined to succeed as his grandfather was at the dawn of aviation 100 years ago. 
Louis Blériot was born into an era passionate for flight. It is the age of the balloon, which has flourished in France since its invention here in the late 1700s. Paris in the early century was one of the centers of the universe, if I may say. And it's a kind of a Parisian tradition to have the people from the city being involved in all these uh, aerial adventures. It was part of the city life. At the turn of the century, Alberto Santos Dumont dominates the Parisian aeronautical scene. Almost everyone has seen him drift by on the wind or sometimes drop down for an impromptu lunch. I think there was something in the water or the air at Paris at the turn of the century that just produced these wonderful characters, like Santos Dumont, for example, who had come to France from Brazil as a young man to study engineering and just threw it all away to putter around over the skyline of Paris. Ballooning allows a liberation from the earth that is intoxicating and more than a little out of control. Even with a motorized propeller to offset the wind, elusive air currents play a major role in where one ends up. As an engineering student, Louis Blériot develops an interest in new heavier-than-air flying machines that would go where you wanted and get there fast. But no one has yet built a successful one. Not Clement Adair in France, with his unfolding bat-like avion. Nor Hiram Stevens Maxim with his 8,000-pound machine in England. And not Samuel Langley and his aerodrome in America. Louis Blériot decides to keep his enthusiasm for flying machines to himself, for fear of being taken for a fool. The automobile is an altogether different matter. The French have, in short order, refined the essentially German invention and adopted it as their own. As nighttime excursions become possible, there is need for a bright automobile headlamp. Blériot designs an acetylene-fueled light and prospers. He meets and marries Alicia Verder. As their family grows, Blériot seems to be settling into the life of a prosperous small industrialist. But as soon as his business provides a substantial income, Louis Blériot responds once again to the siren call of aviation. Louis Blériot's grandson will learn to fly the Blériot 11 at La Fête LA, an airfield and home for nearly 100 period airplanes, all ready to fly. The collection was started in the 1950s, when the father of the current owner, Jean Celis, purchased a Blériot 11 and restored the aircraft so he could fly it. He kept on collecting. Louis Blériot came to me a long time ago, and I understood that he really wanted to cross the channel. He's become a good friend of mine. I couldn't let him throw himself into this project without having the right training. These planes are hard to pilot. Louis trains very seriously. I think of him as our uh, protégé. We've been helping him to succeed in fulfilling his dream. In 1900, the elder Blériot's dream of flight takes inspiration from those best of all flyers, the birds. His first designs are for ornithopters, flapping contraptions with mechanical wings. The ornithopter has been a starting point for many would-be flyers, but the elaborate, heavy machinery required tends to keep them earthbound. The leading aviation journal, L'Aerofile, could report little progress during the first years of the century. Then, in 1903, rumors start to circulate about the experiments of two bicycle makers in America, Wilbur and Orville Wright. 
Octave Chanute, the French-born American engineer, uh, came to Paris and gave a lecture in which he talked about what he had done and what other Americans, including the Wright brothers, had done. Chanute shows how far the Wright brothers had progressed toward achieving a practical airplane. Their methodical approach contrasts with the hidden mis-efforts of other early pioneers. They've even built one of the first wind tunnels to determine what shape gives a wing the most efficiency. Wind tunnel data confirms that a gently curved wing will supply maximum lift. The air moves faster over the top of such a curve, reducing air pressure, causing the wing to rise. But if the curve becomes too steep, the airflow breaks up and the wing stalls. One of the things that set the rights apart was this clarity that they brought to analyzing the problem of the flying machine. They, almost uniquely, recognized that this was really about solving the control problem. How are you going to control this thing once you get it into the air? The Wrights designed gliders to investigate control in the air. They use a double-winged biplane design, fitted with control surfaces, sections that can be moved to change the direction of flight. Their third glider carries an elevator in front to control pitch up and down. The Wrights design a mechanism for twisting the wings to bank and roll the aircraft. They call it wing warping. Behind the wings, they place a rudder to control side-to-side -side movement, or yaw. The rudder, along with wing warping, enables the Wrights to maintain balance as well as turn in the air. It's a crucial breakthrough, intuitively understood by bicycle makers. If you think about a bicycle, when you uh, want to go around a sharp corner in a bicycle, you actually lean it over to go around that corner. If you just tried to turn the wheel without leaning the bicycle over, it would it'd actually fall. So you needed that uh, roll in order to cause the airplane to uh, start to make its turn. Only sketchy accounts of the Wright's progress make it to Paris, but they touch a nerve. The French were just absolutely stunned because it was clear that these two guys, bicycle makers from Dayton, Ohio, were in fact well ahead of anything that the French had dreamed of. The Wrights have solved basic problems of both lift and control in the air, but they have yet to fly a motorized machine. The race to invent the airplane is on. A little band of enthusiasts in the Aero Club de France set out to overtake the Wright brothers and win for France the honor of the invention of the airplane. Louis Blériot himself in a French newspaper was described as one of the militant aviators. They really were uh, just determined to do it. Numbered among the militants are Gabriel and Charles Voisin, both avid bicyclists. When Gabriel is approached to build a glider based on the Wright's design, he can't resist. One June day in 1905, Louis Blériot joins a small crowd to watch Voisin test his new model. Voisin borrows the Wright's biplane design and forward elevator. Blerio is so impressed that he orders a glider from Voisin on the spot. But he wants modifications. The new glider carries curved wings, which Blerio believes will provide greater lift. Never one to take the back seat, he names his glider the Blerio II. Blerio I is assigned to his ornithopters. Voisin tests the glider. This time, he nearly drowns, trying to free himself from the wreckage. Blériot is not in the least discouraged. In fact, he invites Voisin to join him in a partnership. Despite their limited success, they show no lack of confidence. Blériot goes to work on a new design, reveling in the possibilities. My dear Voisin, he says, I am living here through the happiest moments of my life. But by now, the success of the Wrights can no longer be ignored. In fact, they claim to have been secretly flying a powered machine since December of 1903. 
Pirated sketches have been published, but without better proof. Many in France remain skeptical. Blériot was looking for the good formula, so any idea was good. At this time, it was all by trial and error. You have no theory, no scientific uh, arguments that could put people together. Kites are an important way of testing ideas. Blerio informs Voisin that he is determined that a stable flying machine can only be formed with a circular wing front and back. Voisin is appalled that Blerio would forego the already successful rectangular wing design. Blerio was very obstinate, Voisin also. But Blerio, well, he had the money. In the end, Voisin wins a concession. The wings become ovals. The Blerio III is not a glider, but a full-fledged flying machine with twin propellers powered by two gasoline engines. When a workman sets out to test it, in full view of a curious, often mocking crowd, the airplane races wildly about, but refuses to fly. A revised version, the Blériot IV, splices Voisin's rectangular wings onto Blériot's oval tail. The mutation, unable to fly, is seriously damaged as it crosses a ditch. The two partners, their hopes shattered, dissolve their collaboration. On the very same day, balloonist Santos Dumont triumphs with his own flying machine. With the dejected Blériot and Voisin in attendance, Santos Dumont, standing upright as if in a balloon, nurses his 14 beasts through a series of barely controlled hops, the best of which, 722 feet, wins an Aero Club prize. The achievement marks a turning point for Blériot. Having seen a man in the air, he is determined to get there himself and to pilot his own designs. The first airplanes were unlike anything that had come before, but for the most part, they employed components and methods already developed for other uses. The technique of trussing the wooden frame with diagonal runs of piano wire is the same way many bridges were built. Lightweight tension wheels could be found on bicycles and baby buggies of the day. The 25 horsepower engine was first built for motorcycles. The propeller was new, but had roots in the design of marine propellers in use for the better part of the century. Blériot does not arrive at his classic design easily. His approach is improvisational and disorderly, almost the opposite of the rights. But he has money enough to hire the best mechanics and craftsmen. He puts them to work on a revolutionary new design. The Blériot 5 will be a monoplane, one of the first, with a single set of wings, like a bird. Following the Wright's practice, the engine pushes the airplane from behind. The tail is in front, with both elevator and rudder. But this bird barely hops and suffers a series of discouraging crashes. The problem with putting the tail or the control surfaces ahead of the main wing is that uh, the airplane tends to be unstable. It tends to want to reverse itself. You can think of it like a tricycle. If you try and push a tricycle backwards, it tends to want to flip around. I think he had too much imagination. If you look at the designs of his aircraft, they are all very different, very, very different. And uh, to the contrary of many, many other designers who just improved the same idea and sometimes they were wrong and they kept wrong, he was always trying something different. Blériot thinks that the 5 doesn't have enough wing area for lift. So for the new Model 6, he borrows an idea from one of his mechanics and places wings on the front and the back. 
He also moves the engine forward and puts the rudder behind. There is no elevator. To control pitch in this aircraft, Blériot puts the seat on wheels so that by rolling back or forward, the airplane will be weighted to tilt up or down. The six is brought out for tests in July of 1906. At last, Blériot gets in the air. The distance is less than a football field, but for the first time, Blériot has actually flown. Grandson Louis starts his flight training in a Piper Cub, a monoplane from the 1940s that shares some of the characteristics of the Blériot 11. Dual controls allow his instructor to correct any wrong moves. Blériot's use of the monoplane was really interesting. He wasn't the only one of the pioneers who chose the monoplane, but certainly biplane builders were much more common. And the reason for that is clear enough. A biplane structure is very strong, uh, very difficult to break or damage, just a lot of strength. Monoplanes, on the other hand, in this period, before the First World War, had sort of fundamentally weak wing structures. The reason that people like Blériot, the others who built and flew monoplanes, did it uh, was because of speed, I think, as much as anything else. There's less resistance with a monoplane, so, you know, you just have an airplane that's, that's going faster. Louis must learn to land on the front two wheels of the Piper Cup, because the Blériot only has two wheels. Nineteen oh eight will be remembered as the year of aviation miracles in France. Improving on his basic design, Blériot's old partner, Gabriel Voisin, has moved rapidly ahead. In the first months of 1908, Voisin's machines are traveling as far as a mile. By spring, they're staying aloft for over five minutes. The leading aeronauts can all be found at Issy le Moulineau, an airfield in Paris. Here, they are treated like celebrities. The excitement was palpable. You could go out to Issy and see them uh, in the air day after day or trying to get into the air. I mean, it really was extraordinary once people began to fly. It was like realizing something that had been a symbol of human aspiration. But staying in the air is still a problem. When the Europeans and others sort of set out in pursuit of the rights, they paid far less attention to the control issues. They sort of muscled their way into the air with um, engines and, and wings and so on and so forth, and sort of did the best they could with the control that, uh, that they'd come up with. When they're making a turn, they sort of have to skid around the turn with the rudder because they have no real way to balance those wings. Those airplanes are really almost not in control. Louis Blériot has control problems of his own. The Blériot 6 that first got Louis off the ground survives only a few months. The 7 doesn't last much longer. But flying low and slow, the outcome is often not fatal. Blériot reassures the public. A man who keeps his head in an aeroplane accident is not likely to come to much harm, he says. I always throw myself upon one of the wings of my machine when there is a mishap. And although this breaks the wing, 
It causes me to alight safely. He crashed, he crashed and crashed. He was called Le Prince de la Guigne uh, because he had crashed so much. But the Prince of Bad Luck now believes that his hard-won lessons will pay off, that controlled, continuous flight is within reach if the competition doesn't pass him by. When the new Model 8 appears, Blerio has added new control surfaces to the ends of the now larger wings. These are ailerons, flaps designed to roll the plane from side to side, providing balance in a turn. Both the rudder and the elevator are now behind on the tail. The 8 flies and allows Blerio to gain crucial experience as a pilot. One day, ailerons will be standard, but without rigid wings to hold them in place, they are dangerously compromised. Something else is needed. In August of 1908, Wilbur Wright arrives in France to demonstrate his airplane as part of the sales agreement with a French syndicate. Finally, the French aviation community has the chance to see firsthand what they've been hearing about for so long. The Wrights, preoccupied with business, have done little further development of their machine for several years, but they remain confident that they are well ahead of the competition. At the first demonstration, they face a small, curious audience of aviation enthusiasts who wonder, even hope, that all the secrecy has been a cover for some vital shortcoming. The airplane requires a catapult to gain enough speed for takeoff. The right machine rises gracefully into the air and flies two neat circles with precision. The crowd is dazzled. They saw him turning very tight circles, and it just took their breath away. Once they had seen that, they, as one of them said, uh, nous sommes battus, we're, we're beaten. You know, the Wrights have actually done this thing, and we have to learn from them now. As the word spreads, thousands turn out for demonstrations that continue on into the winter. The French adopt Wilbur as a brilliant American rustic, and consume an unending string of newspaper and magazine stories about him. But even with all this attention, Wilbur remains an enigma. The pilot de Lagrange ruminates over who the man is behind the mask. Has he a heart? Has he loved? Has he suffered? Blériot introduces himself to Wilbur Wright and examines his airplane, especially the wing warping technique used to control the airplane's roll. Surprisingly open, Wilbur shows him how the right system bends the entire wing. Excited as a schoolboy, Blerio tells a friend, I'm going to use a warped wing. To hell with the aileron. For Louis Blerio, it is the final piece of the puzzle. He uses it in his classic Model 11, which his grandson demonstrates to Tom Crouch, who has written widely about the Wright brothers and Louis Blerio. This is a big wing. It must take a lot of effort to warp the whole thing. Absolutely, yes. But it's a little easier in the air because part of the weight is uh, off the cables. But you have to pull strongly on the stick to get the, the warping effect. And as regards uh, the rest of the controls, it's exactly like a normal airplane. So you pull uh, the stick to climb and you push to dive. Blario really pioneered this control approach, stick and rudder pedals. Yes, sir, yes. Uh, just the same sort of thing pilots use today, really. Yes, it's amazing to think that after 90 years, the, the, the way to control airplanes remains the same. The first Paris aeronautical salon opens in December of 1908. A Wright biplane is the star of the show. But Louis Blériot presents his latest models, including, off in a corner, the diminutive 11, a direct descendant of the successful 8, but with wing warping. No one pays much attention, 
But with the 11, Blario has built a forerunner of the modern airplane. He used a tractor engine configuration, basically, which means the propeller is pulling uh, the airplane. Uh, that has an advantage that at low speed, particularly in takeoff, you're blowing uh, air over the tail surfaces, th so they're effective at low speed. He had a monoplane wing, which has become standard today, because it actually has less drag and is faster than a biplane. Um, the control surfaces were on the back of the airplane, uh, which is a more uh, stable configuration than having the control surfaces out in front like the Wright brothers did. Uh, so the airplane tends to be self-riding if it's um, sort of going through the air sideways. You can sort of think of it like a weather vane. It will tend to straighten out. By June of 1909, the 11 can stay in the air for a half hour or more. At age 36, Louis Blériot is one of the few men in the world who can fly. But he's running out of money. The cost of his experiments has nearly exhausted his fortune. To raise cash, he sells the patent to his automobile headlight, then his summer home, and finally, his car. I had to keep going, he said, because like a gambler, I had to recover my losses. I had to fly. What he needs now is a spectacular flight to attract attention and buyers for his airplane. There is one possibility. The London Daily Mail is offering a thousand pounds to the first person to fly the 26 miles across the English Channel. After a year, no one has yet dared attempt it. As Louis refines his Model 11, he considers the crossing. Then a popular sportsman named Hubert Latham announces his intention of trying for the prize. Colorful and wealthy, he spends much of his time traveling abroad. When the president of France asked him his profession, he replied, Monsieur President, I am a man of the world. Latham has only been flying a few months, and his plane, the Antoinette, is only recently completed. But he's already broken records for speed and endurance in the air. Latham arrives at the channel and begins preparations for the flight. Blerio intently follows Latham's progress in the press. Technical problems. Then rain and high wind keep Latham grounded until early on the morning of July 19, 1909, when he takes off. Only six miles out, his engine stops. With the English shore not yet in sight, he glides into the water. The aircraft remains afloat. Discovering that his pockets are still dry, Latham proceeds to light a cigarette while waiting for rescue. The Antoinette is a wreck. Although Latham plans to try again, it will take at least a week for him to prepare. Latham's failure prompts Blerio into action. And now, after nine years of waiting and preparation, Louis Blerio is ready to test fly his grandfather's airplane. It's completely different from other airplanes. You feel uh, as if you were about to take off by yourself without any engine, without any wings. You're just about to take off by yourself. Everything was, uh, was perfect, and the plane was uh, flying very well, the weather was perfect, and everything went so well that it, uh, it was uh, magical for me.
Blériot is ready to cross the English Channel, but he has a problem. During a recent flight, insulation came loose from an exhaust pipe, and his left foot received third-degree burns. But he discovers that he can still operate the rudder pedal even while hobbling on crutches. He immediately starts to search for a suitable takeoff site, finally settling on a low pasture that leads directly over the beach to the channel. The site must be as close to the channel as possible. The distance across will require the 11's engine to run at its outside limit for continuous operation. Hello? Excitement builds as high winds ground both aviators. Lerio, who is ready to go, waits for a break, while Latham's team, racing to assemble a new airplane, hope for continued bad weather. High winds from the southwest are accelerated by the geography of the channel. Since the little Blerio 11 cannot fly in winds greater than four knots, accurate weather prediction is invaluable. Reporters are gathering in force. The newspapers build suspense with the question, who will dare to fly first, the dashing Latham or the dogged Blerio? A French reporter, Charles Fontaine, sends Louis a picture postcard that shows a landing spot among the forbidding cliffs near Dover. He promises to be there, waving a French flag to guide Blerio in. Both the Blerio 11 and the Antoinette are now ready for flight. The next morning, the wind has died at last, but Blerio's mood on being awakened is not good. His foot hurts. He is nervous and refuses breakfast. Waking up that morning was terrible, he recalled. I would have been happy if they'd told me that the wind was blowing and no attempt was possible. My grandfather's mother, she said to her friends, you know, uh, Louise is gone completely mad. He wants to cross the channel in a kite. By 4 a.m., the engine is thoroughly warmed up. Latham's camp, observed through a telescope, appears quiet. Just before takeoff, a small dog runs into the spinning propeller, not the most propitious of omens. <laughs> Louis must take off into the wind, away from the channel, then make a turn towards Britain. Below me is the sea. The motion of the waves is not pleasant. I fly on. For 10 minutes, I am lost. I let the aeroplane take its own course. This calm has a dangerous charm. 
I am very happy when I see a gray line which seems detached from the sea. It gets bigger each minute. Without a doubt, it is the English side. I'm almost safe. I fly towards the white cliffs, but the wind and the fog take me in. I must struggle with my hands and my eyes. Three boats appear. They seem to be moving towards a port. Dover, without a doubt. I follow them. Suddenly, on one of the crevices, I see a man desperately waving a French tricolor flag. A feeling of absolute joy fills me. I move quickly towards the ground that he is signaling from. Now I must land, but the winds are strong, and as soon as I approach the ground, a whirlwind lifts me. The struggle doesn't last long since I cannot stay in the air any longer. I cut the engine, and instantly my machine falls straight upon the land. The chassis doesn't take it very well, and the propeller is damaged. But, my goodness, too bad. Only one thing is on Blerio's mind. And Latham, where is he? He is still in France, a newspaper reporter tells him. He had overslept. The Blerio 11, like all early airplanes, is difficult to control at the best of times. But the verdict here is pilot error. In the heat of the moment, a failure to reverse the rudder pedal. The crossing turns Louis Blériot into an international hero. The impact that it had on people was really quite extraordinary. The channel was just recognized as England's barrier, England's wall. And now someone had flown over that channel wall. And as everyone suddenly began saying in the newspapers, H.G. Wells most famously, England's no longer an island. A new era of flight is underway. The editor of Le Figaro, Gaston Calmet, writes, when man can, by the action of his will alone, pass in a few hours beyond all horizons, beyond all the oceans, and above all the rivers, the conditions of human life will be profoundly changed. By the end of 1909, just six years after the Wright's historic flight, the Blériot 11 holds most of the world's flying records for speed, altitude, and distance. During the years preceding World War I, the Blériot 11 becomes the most popular airplane in the world. After Wilbur Wright had flown in France in 1908, and the French came to an understanding of his control system, they just zipped right ahead. And uh, clearly, uh, 1910, 11, 12, France is the most advanced nation in the world. The wreck didn't change my attitude. I have an intense feeling of frustration and disappointment. I said to myself, my grandfather succeeded in getting to the English coast, and you, you weren't even able to make it to the French. I'm doing this for personal reasons, that's all. It's not for money or something like that. It's my goal, and I want to achieve it. And I will succeed one day. That's all. On Nova's website, hear more from Louis Blériot's grandson, take a tour of the Model 11, learn about the first woman to fly solo across the channel, and explore Blériot's early flying machines. Find it on PBS.org. To order this show or any other Nova program for $19.95 plus shipping and handling, call WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424. Nova is a production of WGBH Boston. Corporate funding for Nova is provided by Sprint and Microsoft. Additional funding is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television.
Major funding for NOVA is also provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by PBS viewers like you. Thank you. I am PBS. 